Hi, this is the Portland Media Center Civic IQ series, and I'm Greg Kesich, and I'm here with Mark Dyan, uh, former state senator, former state representative, former Cumberland County Sheriff, current District 5 city councilor, and candidate for mayor. So welcome. Hi, Rick. Hi. Thanks for having me today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so aside from that, those, those resume points, uh, can you tell me a little about your background? Um, yeah. Well, I, I think you covered some of the top line messages, but I mean, uh, one piece that should be said is I spent 21 years with the Portland Police Department. Yeah. And I think the benefit of that is, as far as candidates go, I'm the only one who's actually been an employee of city administration. But more importantly, the time I spent on the department gave me an opportunity to really get to know the neighborhoods of the city and appreciate them for very unique places with aspirations that are local, I mean, some people think of North Daring or Daring Center or the West End. Yes, they live in Portland, but for them, there's another narrative, and that is, I live here in the West End, mm -hmm. and here's how I expect my quality of life to be. So I think the police department gave me that opportunity. And in terms of campaigning, God, there's no better training than to have to uh, attend a neighborhood police meeting and field questions on the spot. Uh, from residents who have concerns about their safety. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Lewiston. Mm -hmm. um, I went to, I graduated from Lewiston High, so I'm a Blue Devil. Uh -huh. uh, I enjoy it when people here say, I remember you in a certain class in Portland High, and I have to correct them. <laughs> uh, no, that didn't happen, but I'm glad mm -hmm. I have a doppelganger out there. I came to Portland to go to the university. Let me ask you about that. What, when, when did you first come to Portland and what are your recollections of the city then? I arrived in the fall of 72. Okay. And uh, I lived out to the Gorham campus, but because of my major was criminology, I spent almost, almost all my class time here in the city. I, I thought Portland at that time was like a big fishing town. You know, I, I thought it didn't feel like city. It just felt bigger than what I was accustomed to mm -hmm. in Lewiston. But... And I also, back home, if you ask someone where they live, they identify a Catholic parish. Uh -huh. All right, I was in Holy Cross Parish, someone else would say St. Mary's. But here, it was my first introduction to the Hill and Libby Town and Parkside as places where people lived. And I remember the waterfront in particular when I was a young foot patrol officer in 77, how marine orientated it was. It was trawlers and draggers and lobster boats and it was dark and uh, a bit of a foreboding place mm -hmm. and i sit back in awe as i review the evolution of that district in the city so yeah let's go back so that's we're talking about a 50-year window here uh, in 72 to, to 2023 yeah, i wish it weren't so uh, <laughs> uh, the, what would you say are the biggest changes in that time well, we've become much more of a destination city. Mm -hmm. I think when I got here, we were a blue collar city. Lots of activities required things to be made or harvested. I mean, I remember the steelworks over on Warren Avenue and a machinists down on the East End. And I had a sense that back then we didn't have brew pubs, we had taverns. Mm -hmm. Most of them were neighborhood and, and the men and women there were centered around blue collar work. It, it wasn't overpopulated with professionals. I mean, you didn't bump into a, a crew of lawyers or financiers talking about whatever was going on in the city of interest to them. So uh, sports were there. Identification with the place. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Westies out of Ruski really saw Portland as centered right there at Danforth mm -hmm. Street. And the same applied up on the hill or down in Kennedy Park. I never got a clear understanding of the boundary between Munjoy Hill and the rest of the city. <laughs> it seemed to always be in flux, depending on who you were talking to. Yeah. So today, you know, this city is about finance, it's about legal, it's about medicine, uh, it's about education, and the waterfront has become more of a destination for people coming from outside of Portland for entertainment or some kind of recreation. And the fishing industry kind of just holds on. You know, I'm, I'm encouraged by ideas of other things that can be harvested. 
and maybe there'll be a resurgence. But I want them to maintain a place. They're a legacy industry, and I would hate for one day, 50 years from now, whoever's having this conversation to say, we can point to the time that that just left the stage, that Portland never had that history to begin with. Let's go, not 50 years, but 10 years. So in your third term as mayor, um, with, can you paint me a picture of the city then? How My third like? term as mayor? Yeah, yeah, 10 years from now. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, 20, I'm always uh, so humble. 20, 2033, uh, uh, what's, what's the city gonna be like? What, and yeah, what, what's your vision for that? I think it will be more dense. You know, we hopefully will answer the demand for people who actually wanna live here and contribute and do so in an affordable way. People say we're safer. I mean, safety is as much a state of mind, like a market, mm -hmm. as it is about actual events, but they'll feel safer. Um, I wanna make sure that they're educated here, that there's an opportunity to be employed here. Uh, I think the city will be more dense, taller buildings, more of them. I think there'll be a lot more development around Back Cove on the peninsula side, for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, I think we will answer the question about how we want to develop Deering and its neighborhoods. You know, whether or not we follow uh, the traffic corridor or not remains an open question. I like to think we have light rail to the city. You know, maybe Union Station becomes something that uh, we can taste again for the first time, the capacity to go other places in Maine and New England without relying on automobiles. I think we'll see many more bicycles on the road than we do now. And a lot of them will probably be electric bikes. I think we'll be more involved in an electric-based economy. So cars and bikes that rely on that energy source will become more prominent. And I think we'll still be struggling with what to do around commercial traffic because that's the last bastion of gas or diesel-driven transportation. Yet they create such a vital link to the rest of the world for us so mm -hmm. how do we make it more affordable for them so i think in terms of en energy and housing and safety that'll be key um yeah great so you, you raise a lot of good issues that i think we need to get into about um you know what what we need to do now to make those things happen in the future but um as you know the position of mayor has been the subject of a lot of controversy over the years uh, there was a lot of effort to get it, get the charter changed, and uh, ever since, it's um, there's been a lot of criticism of the of the current system. And uh, as somebody who's uh, seeking the office, uh, uh, does a mayor make a difference? Does a mayor set uh, influence policy? What's your view about the role of the mayor in this uh, under this charter system? That's a great question, because when I talk to uh, residents right now in my campaign. I think sometimes they're actually confused as to what the mayor does or what that office truly is. I think many of them harbor an assumption that the mayor is some sort of chief executive, that he or she can declare policy and then align city departments to accomplish those goals and objectives. And that's not the case. I've, I've always seen the mayor more as a speaker of the house that a mayor will establish an agenda for the coming year and try to marshal some consensus among his peers on the council. And I think that's, I will see myself as a peer to the council. Uh, I have the advantage of a bully pulpit. I have the advantage of setting agendas and calling for meetings and getting pieces in motion, but I don't, delude myself with the idea that I'm some sort of heroic figure, that I alone will make these things happen. Mm -hmm. So I think when... I, what, I, what are the tools for the mayor to set the agenda? I think it's to have a clear understanding, first of all, the public hopes to see achieved mm -hmm. and to create some trust with his or her constituency that I've heard you, I will articulate that into a workable agenda. I'll consider what benchmarks might be realized to give you evidence that we're moving on that topic. And then I want to turn my focus to the council. It's much like being a, a chair in a legislative committee at the State House. Two parties, 
desperate views of the world, uh, an openness to be conflicted, mm -hmm. and out of that, martial consensus and an agreement about what policy would be most advantageous to our constituents. So what happens in the council chamber is just a small piece of the work in my mind. The large part of the work should be one-on-one -on -one meetings with counselors to make the case. I become the advocate for the residents of the city because my assumption is if they've elected me, they agree with my agenda and they may have informed me to a greater detail than I even considered. So it's advocacy work, one-on-one, -on -one, and it's about giving them the opportunity to see that we can be a team, that we might not agree on each point, but there's a value that we have to act collectively. There's room for dissent, but it should be productive dissent. It shouldn't be dissent just to simply throw a wrench in the production. If there's a dissent that, that announces something we haven't considered, they should do that. But my overall goal is to create a working team. And I think currently people want to hear programs. Like I should have a mm -hmm. list, like I'm running for president, mm -hmm. right? I'm going to do everything, like some magical Santa Claus. And I'll deliver it without cost or hurt or the, the, necess the necessity to work at it. I believe a success takes about five years. That's an overnight success. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen at the pull of a trigger or flipping on a switch. I love that commercial. Just flip on the switch and we'll be there. Mm -hmm. I think it takes much more work than that. So that's my role of the mayor. And at the same time, to build a relationship with the city manager. I think Manager West has made it clear that she, will, she wants to consider the council, and I'm sure more so with the mayor, this idea of a partnership. So we both have different advantages to work from, she has to make it all work. Whatever we decide, she's the engineer. She has to turn it into practical, affordable mm -hmm. uh, delivery. So I have to have an open communication with her and I'm glad to see they're on the same floor. They can go back and forth and talk things through. So that's, that's my role as a mayor, is to be a servant leader to the council. And what about the public? How, how is the mayor's, what's the mayor's role in terms of communicating uh city policy? I, I think the mayor is the official storyteller. I think the, the mayor's role is to give a narrative that's understandable to the public and try to clear up the fog and nuance that can occur in council deliberations. Yeah. I have to be the person that the constituencies and the media can get clarity and concise and passionate answers for if it's necessary. Mm -hmm. You know, the buck stops at the mayor's ma office in order to explain ourselves as a collective to the public. So you're a bridge person. So you've got to make sure you've got the right story to tell, and then you have to tell the story as factually, even in the light of criticism that could follow as to why we're doing the things we're doing. So in that sense, it feels a lot like my role as a lawyer. I represent clients. I advocate their story. It isn't about Mark Dion anymore when I go to the rostrum. It's about making sure a judge, a jury, the general public understands why we took the actions we took. So uh, we've had three people hold this position, uh, very different styles, different kinds of administrations. Uh, and I'm wondering if, uh, what have you learned from watching how other people have handled uh, the job? And is there anything that you would like to emulate from any of the, the three uh, uh, administrations that would have preceded you, um, anything you're going to try to avoid? You know, that's always tough to pass judgment on someone who gave that their very best, or at least gave it their very best as they understood the role. I, I see no benefit in open conflict with a city manager. The city manager is the employee of the council, but as mayor, I would like to consider the city manager as a co-leader, you know, to try to have a straight line relationship with them. You know, they have to believe in your vision and you have to believe in their capacity to carry out that mission. And that requires trusting each other, no surprises. I think open warfare is counterproductive. It hurts the city, never mind the council, never mind the manager or the person, the mayor bringing that war. It, it, it indicates the city can't manage itself. Mm 
-hmm. you know, before you even start deciding who's right and who's wrong. You know, it's never binary that way. And setting that up is not good. I think some other mayors may have saw their role as more central. They were the voice and the complete enlightenment of what a mayor should be. I don't think that's the case. In the committees I've worked on, I've, as I said, I'd much rather be a servant of the committee in order to get them to coalesce around an idea. Hopefully it still resembles the idea that I brought to them, but the process and an agreed upon consensus for a decision is important to the city's best interest. I think being mayor, one has to remember every day, your work is not about your own best interest and what it might mean for the future. It's about the present day needs of the residents and what's in their best interest. So some of my colleagues say, well, you always, you act as a centering influence, you're grounded. Uh, I don't get wrapped up too emotionally. I try to keep it civil, business-like, in public and privately. You know, they chuckle that I'm, I function like a diplomat. I try to bring all the various views together. And to do that, you can't demonize somebody. You can't outwardly attack simply for the purposes of a cheap political point. <clears throat> and don't worry, the council provides lots of opportunities to do that if you're interested. Mm -hmm. But I'm not interested in that. I want, to f I want people to come to me using your five-year scale and say, look, things got done, Mark, while you were there. Mm -hmm. And I think the important work you probably won't even see because it'll be done in a one-to-one -one basis. And it'll be the same with leaders in the community. I will meet with them. I will hear them out. I'll try to figure out how to get them into the fabric of a decision. But that's the role. I guess that's what it is. It's shuttle diplomacy uh -huh. on behalf of the city to see if, in fact, where can you strike an agreement? Who's involved? Have they been heard? Those are the kinds of questions. And I think other mayors have done that. I think Kate, I mean, I've worked closely with Kate Snyder, our current mayor, on a number of issues then. <clears throat> I don't think we're that far apart. You know, once in a while she says, you know, you're still a cop, the way you approach <laughs> these things. I said, well, I can't help it. I was 32 years in that business. You know, teach you certain things. And, you know, she might take more of a curve to get to a point where I'm more inclined to go straight once I feel I have a consensus that we need to strike so that we can go on to the next decision. I don't like delaying inevitable things. Let's bring it to a vote and have a vote and then we can move on. So that, that brings up a good point. And the uh, council is a place where disparate interests come and uh, try to settle disputes, right? That's, that's sort of exactly. the function of the council. And so sometimes you're gonna get consensus and everybody's gonna agree, but a lot of times you're not. Um, you know, how, do you, how do you get people to continue to work together uh, after they've, they, their, their perspective is lost or they, their point of view? It, it's, Somebody once told me when I was on the so-called losing side, it's not that you have a bad idea, we're not ready for it yet, or the public isn't ready for it. It's no reflection on you and your thinking. And that's the approach I would take. We had to take a vote. If it's before us, there's a certain immediacy to it. We can't study it to death. Um, I want to feel that I've made every possible effort to create a consensus. I would allow the council to see if they could in the moment, if they can't. You take the vote and you move on. And when they chuckle, when I've said that to them, I said, look, in law school, I paid attention to minority opinions because now they're suddenly the bread and butter of the majority. Yeah. So yes, in the moment, they were grieved, but they, their thinking has been borne out. I had a meeting with a certain counselor because she and I had a dispute about a policy thing. And I elected not to pursue it any further. And, that particular form. I didn't think it was going to be productive. So we met offsite and we talked it through and I better understand her context than she does mine. And I hope it was one more brick in the trust bridge. So in the future, she'll be more open to what I have to say as I will with her. That's, that's that human resource work that, again, I can give you that Santa Claus yeah. list of pledge promises for programs. That's nice, but none of that can occur unless you build a platform with the council to fairly and honestly air those things out. 
And they got to trust you. They, they don't want to feel like they're going to get sandbagged or belittled or demeaned or attacked as the enemy. Right. So um, I'm not going to ask you for a list of programs, uh, but uh, I wonder if you could give me a, just a short list of what you think the greatest challenge is facing the city right now. Well, I, I've put it out as questions. Okay. I said, I, I, I'm not running on ideas of listing programs. It's an aside. I once worked as a Santa Claus as a college job, uh -huh. and and I felt like I was perpetuating that risk. That didn't get in your resume. We didn't get no, that. no, yeah, no. Yeah. That's a deep dive resume. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I I was telling kids something was going to happen when I was absolutely sure I had no idea if it would. You know, and that's why talking about programs is, in essence, making a a, pro, a promise that, in all fairness, you have no idea if it's ever going to be realized. So what I've been talking about is there should be two questions we ask on the council. There'll be two questions that I'll ask myself when initiatives are brought forward. Do they make us safer? And who the safe party is, is as much a conversation as what the threat is to that safety. And the second one is, aff is affordability. Can we afford it as a city? You know, how do we determine something's affordable? The most elusive pony in the corral is this idea of affordable housing. I've asked many people and I've gotten as many answers as to what constitutes affordable housing. So, and it goes down the line, taxes, fees. Most people don't realize that half of the budget for the city of Portland is predicated on fees, not property tax. You go to Falmouth, it's all property tax. It's a different kind of conversation when you say, am I going to reduce taxes? I like to believe that I work as hard as possible to limit the growth or at least intentionally manage a growth of a tax base if I have to, and a tax levy that follows from that. So when I hear some people talking about, well, let's do away with commercial zoning, it sounds sexy, right? Yeah. It, it's speaking to an idea, another idea, but I go, look, there's a purpose for commercial property in a city. It contributes its own resources to our overall best interests. It answers, or pretends to answer the idea of, how are we affordable? You know, what's the consequence? So that's what I want to say when I go to the council. If I go to the podium, I'm going to say, look, this year, two questions. Everything we talk about, we'll have to answer one of these two questions. Mm -hmm. That the public has told me repeatedly in different ways is what's on their mind. And, and one of the most visible ones on safety is what to do with encampments. Yeah. And that entire question. So. Well, let me push you a little on, on affordability because uh, affordability of housing is the number one issue of the people I talk to. And uh, it's been sort of the standard answer to every politician, every candidate for office that I've ever interviewed in Portland. Wait, let me fill in the blank. I'm going to do it. Yeah. And how? <laughs> You know, how, like how, how, when you're talking about um, uh, expanding housing uh, opportunities and making it affordable, what can the city do? First of all, people should understand we're not in the housing development business, but they think we are, mm -hmm. that we can go out and purchase a piece of property and throw up some sticks and call it affordable housing. That's not our role. I think our, I know our primary role is to provide leverage financing that if a group is coming together with a proposal, we provide that spot financing that can realize other streams of cash for them so they can pull off the project. Um, we have some incentives, you know, in the inclusionary zone concept that if they don't build something that's considered affordable by whatever metric they propose at the initiation of their project, that they put money aside into the Jill Dusan Housing Trust Fund, which for the most part lays kind of dormant, almost $10 million, because developers are caught up in a cycle of unpredictable materials costs. I mean, a simple residential unit's about $350 a square foot, as high as $500 or more. They don't know if they can get the sticks there on time to answer the estimate that they were working from personnel find me a plumber, please, mm -hmm. or a carpenter, or an electrician. I mean, I have some work to do in my own home, real low-level uh, problems to be solved. And I'm told it'll be about 18 months before I can get back to you. I mean, that's not an unusual response. Contractors are facing the same kind of challenge. 
The third place that slows things down where the city could intervene is in the entire permitting process. We, we take a long time to make an administrative decision about the suitability or the standards that we expect in a housing initiation. All right, it, it just, the refrain is the same. I came in, they gave me a list of things to do. I jumped through the hoop and suddenly there was a new hoop. I marshaled my resources, answered that demand. And then there was a third and time is money. And the timeline not only impacts the ability to build, but the cost of material. So it's not a benign experience to say I was held up for 16 months getting permits. Mm -hmm. I served as co-chair of the school construction committee. And those, now we spent $60 million on a number of schools, but the story from the general contractors and the architects is they, they hadn't worked in Portland on a significant project they actually assume they get all the permits done in four months. And I, I when they're when they're working for the Portland School Board, yeah. The board, yeah, they thought it all be done in four months and everything would be good. And it wasn't. And it took mm -hmm. multiple cycles of four months to get things done. That slows down construction. I I've pressed that with manager West and of late she's hired a consultant to review that. But I think we can try to ramp it up. I, I worked with a significant employer here in town who wanted to build affordable workforce housing for his employees. He was even going to give each apartment an electric bicycle, yeah. which I thought was pretty novel. Yeah. And uh, I set him up with people in the city to try to get it done. And after a couple months, I bumped into him and I asked him how it was going. And he said, listen, Mark, thanks for what you did, but I'm going to Westbrook. He says, the minute I showed up, they were willing to get it done next week kind of attitude. And he says, so I'm going to build there. He said, I'm still waiting for answers from Portland. He said, I can't afford to wait, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, the other, the other place where the city has some um, say, uh, city government has some say, is uh, in the zoning. Um, there's a yes. to, to rezone uh, a lot of part, big portions of the city. I mean, we have uh, a couple of... Uh, what you described is the old working class neighborhoods are very walkable, uh, good public transit. Uh, people want to live there so much so that they become wealthy neighborhoods. Montjoy Hill on the West End. Uh, you can't rebuild similar neighborhoods in other parts of the, other parts of town uh, where they have the same kind of access to transportation. And uh, isn't that an area where the uh, the city council uh, and and the mayor could really lead some reform? Yes. To create more housing. Yeah. And it's like affordable housing. I can say it quickly because we're, we're not taking a dive in the pool of details. I think the code was do a revision. They call it recode. That's, yeah. that's the jargon. Um, it makes sense. The issue of density is going out to daring. The question is, how is that going to be done? Where is it going to be done? But more importantly, I attended a couple of recode meetings with the public. It didn't go well. I mean, I thought I would just go and sit and observe as a counselor, you know, maybe talk with people afterwards. But it got to a point I went to the front and did a, an intervention. To <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's the right word, but it felt yeah. like it. Because the public that attended were very frustrated. Their answers, they weren't getting answers to their questions. And I suggested to staff afterwards, I go, listen, you're totally immersed in planning, the code, everything. That's, that's what you do every day. You take for granted everyone understands the entire process and all the terms and the procedures. I have some experience with that in my private practice, so I get it. And I know what to be afraid of and not to be afraid of. They don't know that. We have to figure out a way to be more invest invested and intentional in communicating the purpose behind certain revision proposals. I'm not against revision. Some people already said that. Dion's a NIMBY. I'm not a NIMBY, but I think people deserve a fair shot at understanding the process so they can weigh in or not as to whether they approve it. Mm -hmm. And I think as a counselor or as a mayor, I've got to make sure 
that's there. Recently, I voted against the licensing for the immigrant um, housing center that's going on. Yeah. I, I voted against that because we did everything in executive session, and my district had no idea what was going on. They totally misunderstood, because if you don't understand something, it's fair money to bet you're going to have a negative opinion of it. No one's confused and says, but I'm sure it's going to turn out all right. That's never the math that anybody executes. And they still don't understand it completely. Yeah. And, and we, haven't, we haven't yet to have a community meeting where I could get everybody involved to air it out. And all of them, when I meet with them, say the same thing. I'm not against immigrants. I, I just think the city's trying to pull a fast one here and put another homeless shelter. And how come this gets approved so quickly? And there was such an extended process with Riverside Street. And how come it appears this builder is getting preference? And is it our shelter or not? I mean, basic questions. Mm -hmm. You know, having little to do with the occupants, you know, and it went from being a shelter that was supposed to be for families, then it went to individuals that might still come back to families. So everything's always in a dynamic state. And that's what gets residents anxious. Sure. Right. I mean, yeah, but you're talking about, you know, a city where uh, people are coming here every day from across yeah. the economic spectrum. We have asylum seekers with just the clothes on their back who are hoping to, you know, make a new life here. You have uh, remote workers with very high incomes who are bringing their jobs with them. And um, to them, Portland looks like a bargain. You know, you have uh, empty nesters, uh, uh, you know, couples selling their big house in the suburbs and moving into an urban apartment. And uh, you have no population growth to speak of in this city for, oh, for decades. And uh, how do you protect those residents that you're talking about that were coming out to these meetings from displacement when there are new people coming in all the time? You know, how do we welcome people coming in uh, it, without growing? And I guess the question is, are you in favor of the city growing, having a growth strategy? and? If, uh, if so, how big and how? I, I, to be frank, God, like I hate, I hate trying to triangulate things. I, I think growth that we're kind of intimating in this conversation is something that's going to hurt, occur as a metro. It's not just going to be poor. Like we might have uh, a pretty important seat at the table, but what's going on in Scarborough and Westbrook, Gorham, hopefully in Falmouth in time. That should all be part of an understood strategy among the communities. We, we can't build everything we want here. The available land is, is going away, um, and that's why we might see some density in the other neighborhoods. So we've got to, they gotta be part of that process. I need employers to be part of the process. You know, they used to talk about healthcare benefits. I think they're gonna have to start having conversations about how we partner to create in a public-private partnership more housing. I talked about trying to convert uh, commercial retail, mm -hmm. uh, and I was told, well, you know, the windows, we have to have certain kinds of windows. And I go, well, listen, you know, if I'm drowning, I don't want to argue about the color of the life ring, just throw me a life ring. And I've looked, and other cities have made those modifications so that we could look across from the studio and those top three floors could be residences. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're standing in the way of that as a city government, we need to get out of the way and facilitate that type of development. But, you know, the Portland Metro has grown considerably. Yeah. Uh, it's the city of Portland that hasn't grown. And uh, it is apparently a real draw that people, people want to want to live here. And they're not necessarily represented at those meetings. So uh, are you saying uh, 2030, we should be looking at another you know, census of 69,000? Well, look, my youngest daughter wants to move here from sure. San Diego to Portland, <laughs> right. right? And in our, in our search for a home, I've broadened her horizons from Portland to Cumberland County mm -hmm. because there just isn't anything here. And I wish I could say that I could do something to help my grandchildren grow up, grow up here. I think it's a great city. I don't know. I'm just telling you the process to increase density is going to create conflict. And you're right. Not everybody's there. Some people say, oh, it's just retirees or long-term homeowners that are there, granted. Uh, the younger public that is in those neighborhoods could afford 
these inflated prices. So I don't know how much they see in the conversation. But we're going to have to figure out a way to get them there. That's what I told the staff. Mm -hmm. they, they have to understand. They don't even know what a planning board does, really. I just yeah. looked at the paper today. They're announcing their workshop on a 70-unit development on Hope Avenue. I've gotten calls already about that. You know, th this wasn't the neighborhood that we built into. This isn't our expectation. And, and it's, it's a conversation where people are fearful and anxious. They don't know. They said, look, these are going to be luxury apartments. And I said, well, how much are they going to go for? You know, about 700000 I said, I hate to report to you. That's kind of a median price right now for a house in Portland of any type. So it's going to be a problem. There's no overnight success on that one. Mm -hmm. It's going to take some work. But yes, I like to think that when I came here in 72, my just to put it all in perspective, my apartment, single bedroom apartment in Daring was 131 a month, mm -hmm. you know, with light and heat included, you know, but the real message there is a lot of people in my generation came to the city and there was an opportunity to live here. We could find a place and we could find work and then we built our lives here and put down roots. And I don't think we're in that place anymore and we need to look at that. So with the Jill Duson Fund, I, I talked about on housing committee already, is we need to orient that not just to create multi-units and maybe a portion to affordable housing, but build real low-income housing. You know what's been absent from the conversation? The Portland Housing Authority. Mm. They're doing a lot of good work, but they haven't been part of the community conversation, and neither has HUD at the federal level to incentivize housing for that demographic, which I think is the one that's always living on a knife's edge. I like to get them off that knife edge. And doing so, it might encourage more affordable housing in the city. Um, you pro on your way over here today, you probably saw people living in tents. Um, I know I did. Um, there's more, I've seen more tents around town. There's hundreds of them, uh, more than I've ever seen. I've been here since the late 80s. And um, it's um, shocking, and and I and I see the efforts the councilor make is making to kind of take care of a, of a different of the different larger encampments. But um, what is your take as somebody who has been here a long time? Uh, what is the cause for this incredible influx of uh, homelessness, and uh, what can we do about it? I think the encampments present the most tangible evidence of this idea that we're a service center ever. You know, we, we could report that we were a service city through some, you know, report of math, you know, budget expenditures, contacts with certain individuals, but it wasn't palpable and in the public's vision as it is now. Okay. I, I think the, the encampments are an unsafe environment. I think people in the camps can be exploited. I don't think it's in anybody's best interest to allow a cycle, a downward cycle of self-harm to occur in those spaces. I think the city has taken a position that we can social work our way out of this one. I don't think that's the case, unless there's a role for public safety to manage those spaces so they're safe for everyone. Um, we also have to confront the reality that there could be a significant number of those individuals who've come from other cities because they couldn't make it because there were no services. I mean, that's the constant refrain and battle around general assistance. We eat most of those state dollars, but there's some communities are relieved that we do because they haven't had to deal with the issue yet in their community. So mm -hmm. this the disparity in income and resources you're playing it out on a live stage right now and what that means. So moving, now this is one person talking, but breaking up an encampment so you can scatter everybody to the wind just to see them recollect is not particularly helpful to anybody's best interest. On the other hand, having people reject offers of housing because they don't want to follow any rules doesn't help their cause. You know, no one likes to follow rules. I, I follow certain rules every day. That's how we have a civil society. But if you're not housed and we offer you a space that is safe, 
and can to attend to your needs and you can do the kinds of interactions you need to have happen to stabilize your life and move forward, then the rules should be secondary. Okay, right now, there are no rules inside these encampments and God knows what's going to happen. I mean, I've gone to all of them and sit and watch as any citizen would watch. I'm telling you now, having people that are impaired by drug or alcohol trying to navigate the ins and outs of a propane tank and burners is going to lead to a disaster. I told the manager that. I said, when that goes bang, I said, pardon the colloquialism, but it doesn't go straight up. It goes sideways. It's going to take out a lot of people. And it, it can't have that. I think you can provide safe camping spaces, but they have to be managed. It's just, mm -hmm. and, and therefore, if you tell people, look, we'll give you a safe camping area, but you're going to be barred from sleeping everywhere else. We're going to provide you facilities so you can take care of your toiletry needs. We're going to provide you whatever you need to stay safe. And we're going to have the social worker team coming in to try to make those connections. I can live with that. I can't live with the fact that certain neighborhoods feel held hostage to the notorious and open criminal conduct that occurs there. And I'm really concerned because sometimes some people see this as criminal, but I'm seeing individuals with obvious mental health moments of anxiety. Everybody says it's an incident. Usually if somebody's mentally ill, their, their anxiety gets to such a level that they're not in control of everything. They, they're not tended to either, and that's not safe. You know, I don't know why we can't take someone like that in protective custody and get them to the medical center for an evaluation. Yeah. You know, there's just this sense that we expect the police to have a complete hands-off approach to that. I don't buy that. I think you can do intelligent policing that helps keep all parties safe and protect the interests of everyone. It's not an easy job, you know, but when I was a cop, if that came down, you figure out a way to get it done. Well, you hit on two of the, the biggest ones, um, untreated mental illness and, mm -hmm. and substance use. And uh, it's pretty clear that whatever the state is doing is inadequate uh, for this population. And where does the city's responsibility begin and end? And you know, I, I mean, these people obviously need help. Well, as a practical matter, as a humane matter, you've got to deal with the presenting issues, the identified, and I'll call them a patient because I'm comfortable saying that. The identified patient has a need, it's not being met, and you get a negative outcome as a result. I think we have a duty as human beings and as the local government to intervene and stabilize that person. And letting them stay in a camp without any of that is not my idea of stabilization. You do that, but I think as mayor, as counselors, we got to press the state. This is a state issue. It's kind of like the immigration. You know, once upon a time, we're both old enough with this city that when Southeast Asians first arrived in Portland, there was nary a ripple to the general community because there was an understanding between Catholic charities and other social service providers that every arrival would have a sponsor family. And it worked. You know, those individual families were the key transition agents to their successful entry into our community. We don't have that now. You know, we get a bus, and I'm, I'm using it just to make a, an exaggeration, but it's nonetheless true. They arrive here with no connections, and the connections they have by phone and otherwise are people that just got here a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. So they're not much help to them either. And... Uh, I've said it on the floor of the council, and I also was reminded that, you know, if you upset the administration in Augusta, they might not meet our needs in general assistance. I go, well, you know, sometimes you got to roll the dice. You know, I mean, yeah. I believe, I firmly believe the public is in consensus around the idea that this is also a state responsibility. Cities weren't supposed to be immigration reception centers standing alone as islands in the broader state. Mm -hmm. The state has to come to the conversation. And offering the possibility of an office with one person in it, I don't think is particularly helpful. <laughs> I know they lauded that in the media. Yeah. I, well, I'm sorry. I sat back and said, I mean, that's like frosting with no cake. Yeah. You know, looks good. It'll taste good. It'll get, I mean, could you think 
of the person who gets that position, what could they possibly do than sit in the chair and be overwhelmed on day one? Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, there has to be a commitment at the state DHHS, and there has to be a commitment in the legislature. I mean, people in our delegation have to stand up and say, look, this is, not, this is a state problem. Because if it spills out from here, it'll be in Lewiston and Bangor in time. They won't escape the trajectory of this issue. It'll just be a delay. So we should get ready for that. And the state should provide leadership. I mean, we're a city council. We don't do foreign policy. I can't intervene in South Texas or Arizona. There are other people that need to do that. You know, and we... Portland has such a great reputation that whatever problem you throw our way, by God, we're going to figure it out. Like we have unlimited capacity and resources to do it. And I'm telling you, we're running out of runway. Mm -hmm. I know it's not a pretty picture. Um, I'm going to go back to something I think I heard you say, is that you would be open to um, encampments that were um, with services that were regulated, that, that had some supervision. No, I think the rules. services, you're like, close. Uh, okay. <laughs> give, give, okay. Give, give, I think complete the loop. Completely, okay, uh, a, a managed campsite would have, uh, be open, of course, to access from our social services uh, teams as well as outside third parties that want to participate in that strategy. But it would be managed by the police to make sure that it's a safe space. And it would welcome those who want to camp in that environment. But the only way that's going to work is we have to have the will to say we will not allow camping all over the city. That if you need, we don't have space and housing and you have to camp, we respect that reality and we're gonna provide you safe harbor at whatever that location is. So I think we reduce the threats that are actual by a butters to these current encampments. We make it safe for the people who have to choose to live in a tent. I mean, I wouldn't choose to do that. If somebody offered yes. me a bed somewhere, I'm out of here. But then there are others right now. It's like a, it's a Switzerland where not, no one can touch them for anything they're doing. Look, they, I watched them deliver drugs. I was a cop long ago. I know what handoff looks like. I mean, in the past, I would have walked up and said, could you turn around, put your hands on the hood? We got to have a conversation. But they believe, not only do we believe, but they have come to a conclusion that they're safe from any kind of police intervention. There's a mountain of bikes over there on Marginal Way. They didn't drop out of the sky. You know, those belong to someone and we let them sit there, which is testimony to the fact that we don't feel we have a business to intervene with public safety. And they're chopping them up and painting them. So I where, mean, where does that come from? Where, where, where does the, the, uh, the, the policy around uh, is that the police chief, or is that the city manager, no, no, the, or is that the is that the council? No, the police chief has come real late to this movie. Yeah, like we're almost at the epilogue, and he can we blame him yet? No, 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 we can't. Okay. Wait. He's, not, he's not eligible to be blamed right now. Okay, it comes out of a case called Martin v. Boise, Idaho. In that particular community, some unhoused individuals uh, were denied housing because the three shelters in that community were run by religious denominations. And this group, the plaintiffs, said we need housing, but we don't need religion. So therefore, they were either unwilling to go in but had bad experiences and told not to come back. So Boise police officers arrested them for camping in public spaces. So it wound its way to the court, made it to the Ninth Circuit. And for lawyers, we always smile because that's the most liberal of all the federal appellate circuits. And they took a look at it, and the summary will tell you that they concluded that absent any shelter available, the camping, the camping ordinances couldn't be enforced, okay? And I suspect a lot of people read that in the first few pages and said, okay, we got it, but they didn't continue reading the case. I think the justices to their credit, also recognize there could be circumstances where things other than um, allowing them to stay there could be uh, accomplished by the police. For instance, they were real clear to say, you can camp, but you can't erect semi-permanent structures. You know, so as we 
put on pallet walls and flooring and bring in the stoves and the tiki bar that's down there, those justices would have said, you know, you're taunting reasonableness now by doing that. Mm -hmm. As a consequence of that, Police agencies, municipalities throughout the 10 western states that are in that jurisdiction scramble to create policies about how to have engagement with homeless people uh, because many of them are in a similar situation. They have more need than they have resource in terms of providing um, a place to sleep. That panic then ran east and found Augusta. And the legislature passed uh, a statute announcing a protocol of what the police were to do if they confronted a non-housed individual committing a crime. And all of the steps that they outlined that had to be considered involved some sort of discretionary, diversionary act on part of the police, and in summary, kind of excuses the criminal conduct and let's focus on the need and send them on their way. Um, it also directed the Attorney General to do the same thing. I've served with Attorney General Fry. We were seatmates for six years. And uh, he's a criminal lawyer. And I was kind of like, wow, he didn't, he didn't sign on to a suicide pact surrounding community safety, did he? Well, I got to the back pages of his protocol, where really the good stuff always lingers. Yeah. And he said, look, this is all important for the police to do. However, if there's a conclusion that the totality of the circumstances requires the police to do something more than this, something more traditional, then they should do it, but I would like them to have at least this protocol as part of their policy. Mm. So they don't ever get to say, I don't know what to do with a homeless person. You know, that we've talked about it and we have a, a criteria of things we should consider. But I don't think he gave them a grant of immunity. He didn't pronounce, look, anything done by homeless people is off limits to criminal justice. If you and I engage in certain conduct, we might expect a sanction. Two homeless people engage in similar conduct. To my mind, they run an equal risk of sanction. Okay. You know? So here we are. Like, where does this leave uh, Portland, Maine, 2023? Um, hundreds of homeless people on the street. More than, more than we can house in a, in a shelter. More than our social services uh, can, uh, can service. It's going to get ugly. I think we're going to have to commandeer some spaces somewhere or, or, or push the governor. I mean, I, you know, I called her out on felonizing heroin possession. I thought that was a ridiculous overreach by government. Mm -hmm. She didn't like me for it, but it wasn't about me being like, remember, it's not about my best interest. You know, if this, it's about our community best interest. We have to call her out. She has to provide things. I long ago told the mayor and the manager, she should at least give us National Guard tents and field kitchens so we could serve these people and make them safe. And she said, I'm not going to do that. I don't think she gets to have the luxury anymore Say, I'm not going to do that. And we've got to be loud about it. You know, and it will take, I'll take a hit. What is she going to tell me? What is she going to tell me? Go home? Probably. <laughs> I'm okay with that. And if the certain public says, Mark, now Mark's the one acting imbalanced, all right then you don't have to elect me or you don't have to reelect me. But I think somebody has to be able to stand up and tell her it's over. The, mm -hmm. the traditional duck and shadow game is done. We have a real problem. It's not a city problem. We don't have the capacity. We can't keep going to the taxpayer and say, social service is going up another 40% next year, mm -hmm. you know, because they think it's a state problem. And actually this time the they is a right. They're right. You know? And I want to close with this. Yeah. And what's really going to press us, whether I'm the mayor or not, because I'll be here till the end of December, winter's coming. You know, we don't have time anymore. It's kind of like we have people adrift on top of a boat that's sinking. We have a date certain now. It will sink when the first snow flies. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to. And if we don't act, what does that mean? You know, who bears the responsibility? I mean, it's, we can't study this to death. We don't need another commission. You know, some of my colleagues are calling for more committee work. That's great if we were San Diego, but we're not. Mm -hmm. You know, and when the snow comes, the you and cry is palpable about whether or not we're going to allow people to freeze to death. I would rather not see that.
when I was sheriff, I offered the gym. Mm -hmm. I was told by some advocates, well, the optics on that are really bad. I go, are you kidding me? They're freezing <laughs> out there. Did they use my gym? No. no. They struggled to find other places. And I said, look, if you come into the jail gym, I'll feed them. It'll be warm. We'll have cots, blankets. My medical staff will evaluate them for any acute needs they might have. And in the morning, they can all go about their business, you know? But the optics were bad. Yeah. We're, we're beyond that now. Right. Well, we, the optics are very bad. The, the yeah, optics yeah. are bad now, but yeah, we, yeah. we have to do something. And it might not be exactly what we all yeah. want done, but it's got to get done. You can't just, you can't delay it. People yeah. are writing right now, do not clear the camp tomorrow. Do not, you know, just status quo everything. That doesn't bode well. I mean, we're in September now. November can be pretty harsh under the right conditions. Yeah. So I got a, a couple of quick ones. Um, uh, the, you know, the, the city agenda over the last five years, maybe longer, has been set uh, not by elected city councilors, but by direct democracy through referendums. Uh, some of the biggest changes that have happened in, in terms of city policy have come through that process and not through your process. And uh, is that a good way to run put, run things? Is that you have any ideas of how to, uh, should that be changed? Uh, is it too easy? This council doesn't have an appetite to really address that. I, that's the short answer. My answer is there's no way to run a city. You can't do it by referendum. I, I respect the referendum process, but the question should be clear and it should be a change in navigation, not the whole writ cloth of a new initiative and programs and an unknowing of how it has to connect with all other parts of city ordinance or, or practice. That's, it's like marijuana. When people voted for that, it was clear, yes or no. Mm -hmm. You know, and they left the regulatory machine to the state. That doesn't happen here. Referendums come with all the tails and they don't fit sometimes. And what I've tried to tell counselors is, listen, if we want to respect the referendum process, I'd like to do that as well. But maybe within 18 months of passage, if we identify that it's creating more havoc than solving an issue, then we should be able to intervene. Uh, they weren't too keen on that. And then we got it up to a super majority to intervene. That means seven of us would have to concur. And they're still not happy with that. Um, what about so, going back out to the voters? Sending it back out to the voters? Yeah, going, you know, making and proposing a, a revision. We could. There's nothing preventing us from doing that. But the point is, you're just, to me, you're, um, you're just coddling a cycle that's not helpful, right? I mean, we might as well all stay home and just submit referenda on a timely basis. Mm -hmm. and, see how it all sticks on the wall. I, I don't think it's the way to move forward. And I think if we identify problems, I mean, we know we have a problem because almost 60% of our residents are tenants. We kind of deal with that on the margins. We got to hit that head on. Yeah. I'm willing to do that, but we can't begin by demonizing both sides of the conversation and try to short circuit these referendums. I mean, there's certain constituencies in the city that like them because they feel disempowered taking it through normal city council process. And I can understand that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's designed to be that way. We don't change overnight. It's incremental. I mean, every government is designed that way. But I think if you marshal it ahead of time, you can move it a lot faster than you'd think mm -hmm. if you have that additional consensus in the community working with the council. You know, so uh, one of the issues that keeps coming up in referendums is uh, short term rentals. I think it's going to is it I might have lost count, but I think it's the third one uh, is coming up on this ballot. Could even be the fourth. It could be the fourth. Uh, what's your take on the issue? Not, not necessarily the referendum, but um, the referen the issue itself is of uh, short term short term rentals. rentals. Is it a problem? Are they um, is the regulation sufficient? Is the uh, uh, enforcement sufficient? I, I mean, we have a whole bureaucracy now, the Housing Safety Office that didn't exist 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. They're trying to manage it. But I, I think, well, I, I did it in the last housing meeting. We're suggesting 
to pay a subsidy to get a short-term rental owner to come off that market and enter long-term rental market to try to convince them first with a cat with a carrot rather than a stick we're always we love beating people up with sticks if there's a new stick by god give it to me we'll use it somewhere you know this is a carrot to say look here's an incentive to lead take your property and place it in this category because our need as a community is much more significant for long-term rental than it is for short-term rental i i hope that those in that community will say, okay, it appears they actually might want to work with us and we should sit down and do that with them. It's unfortunate that we've all decided to become mini hoteliers. I mean, I think there's a, there's a room for that in the private sector. I think boarding houses used to provide some kind of resource to right people. That was the best they had, beat sleeping in a camp. But the idea of everybody's a vacation home, I don't think advances the best interests of the entire community it it maximizes the benefit to the owners but i think they have to we have to advocate with them that they should be good citizens and try to meet the best interest and can we strike a balance with them you know mm -hmm. that's that's why i started talking about that incentive just as a way to say hey look we don't have it all right but neither do you but we can look at the outcomes and where do we think we share in creating that outcome and do we can we have a mutual interest in trying to shift that you know mm -hmm. i'm go ahead oh do you think we have too many i don't know how many we've got i don't have a <laughs> look i mean to be yeah, honest yeah. i mean i live uh, i live i'm in a regular single family uh neighborhood single unit family and my neighbor, who's a pretty well-known person, suddenly converted his house into a weekend bed and breakfast. I mean, and we never knew about it. Did I have any complaint? No, but it kind of changes your understanding of what a neighborhood is about, you know? Because uh, neighbors would say, well, who are these people? And, you know, there were parties and things. Never out of hand, but we didn't know we had adopted by de facto uh, a commercial enterprise mm -hmm. you know and i if he wanted to rent it out i wish he had talked to me because there are a lot of potentially really good tenants out there who would have moved in mm -hmm. you know my my two daughters are tenants out in california and they're in their mid-30s and they told me dad you know we're kind of coming to a place where we understand we will never own a home, that we will be in some kind of tenancy no matter where we go. That makes me sad because that was our big dream in our generation was we'd own a home. So if they're going to be in a world of tenants, then we have to make tenancy make sense. You know, and it should be a platform to exploit people mm -hmm. and that there's a long-term positive return on a long-term tenant, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, it's a ranked choice ballot. You're going to put yourself one? Who's, yeah, of course. Who's, who's number two? Me. You're going to put yourself two? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't understand. I might privately pick somebody two. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I'll get to three. Mm -hmm. I just, I mean, I never sit in bed and say, if it's not me, who are the three best people to replace <laughs> me? I'm not that difficult to replace. You know, so I, I think there's one person that I go, okay, if all things were equal and I lose, I could come to terms with them being the mayor. I could come to terms with anyone being the mayor because really I should know the public put them there. So mm -hmm. I, it's my problem, not theirs. So, but no, I'm not going to go one, two, three, four, five. I mean, that's... Okay. Uh, let me just let, let you wind up with um, why do you want to be the mayor? Why and um, and why should we vote for you? Because I love this city, and I think I've demonstrated that for 45 years. I've served in a lot of different capacities because I believe in Portland. The people live here, and I want it to be better than it was last year. I I value this place. Um, I've seen people grow, create families, grow old. You know, and we all hold in common that. Portland is what ties us together. I think I have the right personality. 
um, to lead powerful egos and interests to a common goal. Um, I spent a lifetime professionally and privately honing skills that I think can be brought to the forefront. I may not be the best choice in 10 years, but at this moment in time, I think I am the right choice. I'm going to bring balance and reason, practicality, pragmatism. The, you only learn those through trial and error. I've had my share of both, and I think that that is a resource that I provide fellow counselors in the city, so that's why I want to be mayor. Great. Well, hey, thank you very much. This okay. is a really interesting conversation, and yeah. thank you for running. Thanks, Greg. I appreciate it.